I share my faith with others to fulfill God's purposes. Do you? I've asked this question before. I want to make sure we're still on the same page. It's been a while, so I want to ask this. Whose job is it to grow the church? Who? I was waiting for a bunch of fingers to point right back at me, you know. <laughs> Glad we're on the same page. When I was growing up, I honestly thought it was the minister's job to grow the church. I envisioned our minister out on the streets, knocking on doors, evangelizing, inviting people to church, spending all of his time outside of regular business hours, you know, business office hours, outside of writing sermons and visiting the sick and doing all the other stuff. He was out there inviting people to come to our church and knocking on doors, and that was his job. And my question that I would ask myself, why should I do it? We hired this guy, right? He should do it. But something years ago changed my attitude toward sharing my faith with others. I realized that it wasn't just the minister's job to grow the church. The responsibility belongs to you and to me, as we all mentioned together here this morning. It is all of our job to grow the church. The responsibility belongs to anyone and everyone who follows Jesus. Anyone and everyone who follows Jesus. Why should I do it? Why should I share my faith? Aside from fulfilling God's purposes, as we mentioned before, I'm going to give you two other reasons we should be sharing our faith with others. And this first reason I want to share with you, I think should resonate loud and clear to every single one of us. And that is, heaven and hell are real. Heaven and hell are real places. Now, you think back when you decided to follow Jesus, these were big reasons to do so, right? Like, we wanted to go to heaven. Why wouldn't you want to go to heaven? Uh, it's the promise of living forever in the presence of a loving and gracious God. It's seeing Jesus, our Savior, face to face. Uh, it's living in a mansion and walking the streets of gold and, and watching that river flow down the middle of it and, and eating from the tree of life. It's, it's the hope of living a better life there than we do here. I love that song, that second song we sang, uh, because it just speaks highly of what my longing is, what my, where my heart is. I can't wait to get to heaven. We certainly, on the, on the flip side of that, we don't want to go to hell. You know, Jesus describes hell as a place of torment, a place of, of everlasting fire where the heat never lets up. It's a place where darkness prevails. Uh, it's separation from God. You don't get to see Jesus face to face. It's uh, a living your life in a place wishing that it would just, wishing some kind of relief uh, from the worst agony and pain and turmoil you could ever imagine. Wishing maybe that you could even die just to get it over with. We didn't want to go to hell. And so what breaks my heart is knowing that every day, you think about this, every, every day people are dying and going to a place just like that. That should break our hearts. Knowing that heaven and hell, especially hell, knowing that these two places are so real, that it, in our minds, knowing that when people die, they're going to go to one of those two places. And it should break our hearts knowing that there are people going to hell every single day. Revelation is very clear on what happens at the end of the world, at the end of the universe, at the end of time as we know it. The Apostle John, seeing all this stuff laid out before him, he sees heaven and he writes this in Revelation 21, 27, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written where? The Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? How do I know? Trust me, you know. He also saw hell. John sees hell and he writes this in Revelation 20, 15. He says, if anyone's name is not found written in the Book of Life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, between you and me and everybody else, that's not a vacation I want to spend, you know, my, an unending vacation I want to spend at. You know, I don't want to be at a lake of fire for the rest of all of eternity. And so, uh, when we realize that hell is just as real as heaven, 
I don't think we'll want to do anything else but share our faith with those around us. Unless we just don't care. If you don't care where anybody's going, you know, that's, that's a shame. It breaks my heart knowing that people are going uh, to hell every single day. So, heaven and hell are real. Here, here's the second reason we should share our faith with others. And I already mentioned it, but it's pretty simple. It's what? It's our job. It's our responsibility. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, He says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Do what you can to make followers of Jesus Christ, people who are learning about Jesus in all nations. Go everywhere. And I I think because these 11 guys that were standing on this mountaintop with Jesus hearing these words, because they took that seriously, the church is born and it continues to thrive even through today. And you know, it wasn't just up to them, just like it's not just up to the minister to grow the church. Uh, Paul gives us some directives in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Now look at verse 20. Read that out loud. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Do you know what that means? We're Christ's ambassadors. As though uh, we were making an appeal by God himself. That God is making his appeal through us. It's our job. Here's what it means. It's our job to be representatives of the greatest kingdom, the world, and the universe, and everybody else will ever know. Are you representing Jesus Christ in your daily life? Not just when you show up here on Sunday morning to church, but are you doing it every single day to the people around you? So it's our job to represent the kingdom of God, to represent Jesus in our lives, to be genuine and authentic in that. But how do we do it? You ever think about that? Like, how do I share my faith? What does that look like? Watch this video. Evangelism is not for the weak, all right? I should know. I wrote a whole book about it, self-published. Most Christians, they are just good for bake sales and potluck dinners. But I'm telling you this right now. It takes a lot of moxie to grab a non-believer by the shirt collar and throw him in the front doors of a church and say, hey, try living out your heathen life in front of a holy God that way. It is like holy water on a vampire. That's divine intervention, my friend. Repent for the kingdom of the Lord is nigh. Come to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, sir, it sounds like you're really passionate about Jesus. I am. Um, And you should also be. Okay. Passionate about the Lord. Sir, if there's... You need to get sanctified or chicken fried. You need to get with the Lord or drive a Ford. Sir... Get right or get left. I share my faith. Okay, that's a lie. People don't even know I'm a Christian. I want to. Again, another lie. I hardly shower, much less have the will to do anything else. Mm, Okay. Now, if there was pizza and ice cream every time there was faith sharing, I'd do it. That's a lie. I'm lactose intolerant. Again, another lie. I'm just too cheap to buy dairy. Bottom line, sharing my faith makes me sweaty. Uh, Tip number 95, um, use big church words like transubstantiation. Heathens get confused easily, and the more confused they are, the more shame they are. The more shame they are, the more apt they are to make a decision for Jesus Christ. I believe it's a responsibility, no, the privilege, no, the glorious privilege of every believer to share their faith with others. That's why I share my faith with everyone I come in contact with. Everyone, really? (laughs) Yeah, everyone. How do you do that? Uh, check out my shirt. Can't read it? Try this glove. Not working for you? How about this bracelet? No comprendo? Vistazo a estos. <laughs> Driving behind me? Read my bumper sticker. It says, it's okay if you follow close. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> oh, you're my waiter or waitress? I got a tip for you. 
Surprise! It's the gospel. I mean, what do you want, money or eternity? <laughs> I also use these tracks. <laughs> so what about talking to people about your faith? <laughs> I, I don't really like people, but I love Jesus. <laughs> Scripture mint? Hi, my name is George. And I'm Jorge, and together we're George and Jorge. Right, right. Uh, what we like to do is to take secular songs and reprogram them. Yes, the purpose is for evangelism. We like to take songs to the unbelieving world and make it believable. Right, right. Let us give you a sample right now. Hey, lost sinner, I just have to ask you, what makes you tick? What is it? You're headed to H-E double hockey sticks. Hey, lost sinner, why don't you just give it all up to Jesus? Tonight, pray for your soul today, for your soul today, just pray. How many of you can identify with that Italian guy? He was chomping on his gum, and he said, sharing my faith makes me sweaty. You know, I, I identify with that guy, you know, like especially, you know, when you think about how to share your faith, a lot of us think about, you know, I got to go door to door and knock and, and talk to strangers about my faith. That makes me sweaty just thinking about it. Handing out salvation tracts at the grocery store. Have you ever done that? I've never done that. I mean, that's just weird to me. Or standing on the street corner and, and with that megaphone and shouting, uh, you know, uh, what did he say? You need to get sanctified or chicken fried. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would encourage you, don't. Don't, don't do any of that. <laughs> uh, it makes, when, I, when I think about sharing my faith in these ways, it, it makes me sweaty. You know, it's uncomfortable, it's unnatural, and I think sharing our faith doesn't have to be scary. There's nothing that has to be scary about sharing our faith with people. It doesn't have to be difficult. How do I share my faith with others? And that's what I want to talk about in this next section. So write these in your notes, and I think sharing our faith really starts with relationships. It starts with relationships. Um, and, and I think the first relationship we really need to work out as Christians is our relationship with God. We've got to work that out. And, 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 and I, I mean, I want you to seriously evaluate your relationship with God. How is your relationship with God? How is it really? Do you see your relationship with God as kind of like a business transaction? You know, Lord, uh, you save me. Man, I'll show up in church every Sunday morning. Is that kind of how you see God, maybe? That it's just this business transaction. As long as I do the right things, He's going to save me. Or maybe you see God as a cosmic genie in the bottle. All you got to do is rub the lamp, and He pops out, and He grants you three wishes, gives you whatever you want. Wouldn't that be great? Or maybe, maybe God is just maybe somebody, some guy you visit on Sunday mornings, and then you kind of forget about Him the rest of the week. How, do you, how is your relationship with God? How, really, uh, how is it really? I think a lot of us in this room, I hope anyway, and I pray anyway, that a lot of us have realized that uh, what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he said, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. That means something has changed in our lives. We're, we're a brand new person. Maybe you're allowing yourself to be, as Romans 12, 2 says, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it's not just a Sunday thing for you. Like, this is your daily life. Your relationship with God is like your relationship with your best friend. You're getting to know Him. You're being transformed by Him. You're, every time you spend time with God, you walk away a little bit better than you were before uh, you started that. And so being, being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus Christ, is more than just checking off the boxes. Went to church, chick. Went to Bible study, chick. I dropped my money in the offering tray, chick. Took communion. How many of you see this as kind of like medicine for the week? Doesn't it remind you that? Like you pop a pill and you chase it down with some, some juice? 
It's more than that. It's not even that. I mean, this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But you did it. Check. Didn't cuss today. Check. Whatever it is in your relationship with God, it's more than just checking off the boxes. This is, this is real. Being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus means living day in and day out as a follower of Jesus Christ and learning how to do it better today than you did it yesterday. It's a real thing. Being a Christian Being a follower of Jesus means that you know the story of Jesus and that your story intertwines with His story. And are you living that on a day-to-day basis rather than just checking off the boxes? Read my Bible, check. It's more than that. It's more than that. How is your relationship with God? We've got to get that figured out before anything else can happen. And that's the second relationship we've got to work out, and that's our relationship with people. If this, if this isn't right, this vertical relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if that's not right, this, this is going to be terrible. And so i got to ask, how is your relationship with other people in your life? Whom do you love? Whom do you hate? When you think about when your enemy or somebody you don't like, you know, when they get what they deserve, Do you like stand up and cheer and go, yeah? How bad is that? Do you talk about people behind their backs? Are you cutting people down or are you building them up? How do you feel about people of different races? Do you get along with people or do you constantly find yourself fighting and bickering with them? How do you feel about your neighbor and your mom and your ex-wife and this and that? How do you feel about people? How is your relationship with other people in your world? If this is not right, none of this will be worked out ever. And if we can't get relationships right, forget about sharing our faith with other people. It's just not going to happen. Jesus sums up life, all of life, pretty simply. He says two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Jesus puts it pretty simply. Love God and love each other, people. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. It's simple, yet we fail miserably at it, don't we? We fail so miserably at it. But if we, if, if we got it right... What a difference it could make. Our relationship with God and with people comes down to two things. It comes down to being genuine and authentic. It comes down to being genuine and authentic. When our relationship with God is genuine and authentic, then we can begin to have genuine and authentic relationships with the people in our lives. And I think sharing our faith it has to start there. It has to start with our relationship with God, being genuine and authentic with God and getting to know Him and how His story works in our lives and how our story actually is a part of His story ultimately. And it's working out our relationships with people in our lives that they are genuine and authentic and real. That's what it's about. It starts with relationships. Now I want to get into Acts chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Acts chapter 8, we're going to spend... Um, the remainder of our time in that, in that chapter. In Acts chapter 8, we read this story about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I love this story. We're going to start in verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We're going to jump right in. Here's what it says. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. What's happening to Philip here? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. What's he having? He's having a blank moment. Not a senior moment. <laughs> What's that Greek word? Remember a couple weeks ago? Kairos moment. He's going to have a Kairos moment. God is setting Philip on this path to have this moment from God, this special, significant moment in his life where God is going to use him to do something great, to change somebody, to do something for God. That's a Kairos moment. I love that. God says something to Philip through, a, through an angel. And Philip is about to do something about it. Those two questions at the bottom of your message outlines. What is God saying? What are you going to do about it? We should be constantly asking those questions. So here's what Philip does. Verse 27, he started out on his way. He met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man's pretty important. 
He had gone down to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. How fortunate. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Here's another Kairos moment. Go to that chariot, stay near it. He's listening to God, and he's going to do something about it. So verse 30, then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? And and the the Ethiopian's like, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So we invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, what do we know from this story so far? Well, outside of the story, we know that Philip loves God. Philip loves God. He spent three years with Jesus as one of his apostles. Philip loves God. We also know that Philip loves people. Philip was always bringing people to meet Jesus. Philip was the guy that went to Nathaniel and said, Hey, we've, we found the Messiah from Nazareth. Remember what Nathaniel said? Nazareth, can anything good come from there? That was Philip that brought Nathaniel in. Philip in chapter and the. Uh, first part of chapter 8, and I think uh, part of Acts chapter 7, we find Philip preaching the gospel to everybody he could find. He loves people. We know these two things. So his relationship with God is good. His relationship with people is good. It's genuine. It's authentic. And now Philip makes a determination about the people that God puts in his path. Philip makes a determination. That's the second part of sharing our faith. We've got to make a determination about the people that God has placed in our lives. We've got to determine something about these people that God places in our lives. You don't have to go blindly knocking on doors and talking to strangers, unless you don't have any friends. Then I would encourage you to go out and make some friends in some way. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to stand on the street corner with a megaphone. And I I beg you, please don't do that. You don't have to put up Christian memes on your Facebook page or wear Christian t-shirts or hand out tracts to strangers at the grocery store. You don't have to do that. Chances are, here's what I'm getting at, chances are God has already placed you in a relationship with people in your life on purpose who need Jesus. Chances are God has already placed you in a relationship with someone who needs Jesus. Who are they? They could be your family members. It's no coincidence that you married the person you married. He or she needs Jesus. And you know what? In your mind, you're thinking, so does his (sighs) in-laws. It's no coincidence that they need Jesus in their lives. It's no coincidence that you're married to that person. It's no coincidence that you're, uh, you're hanging out with the friends that you hang out with. It's no coincidence that you work with the people whom, with whom you work five days a week. It's no coincidence that, that you know your waiter by first name basis. You know what they like to do for hobbies. It's no coincidence that you know the name of your grocery clerk at the grocery store. It's no coincidence that these people are in your life. There's a reason that God has placed them in your life. In Philip's case, this is interesting, God places Philip in a position to share his faith with a, with a stranger on the road. Somebody he doesn't know, but Philip is listening. Who has God placed in your life? I want you to write their names down right now. Think about who's in your life circle that you come in contact with uh, maybe on a daily or weekly basis. Who is in your life? Write their names down. Go ahead. I'm, I'm waiting. Write their names down. Who is in your life that need Jesus, that needs Jesus? Who are they? I'll give you a couple more seconds. Write their names down. Here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. I want you to pray that God would give you the opportunity and that you would see the opportunity to plant a seed in his or her life, in in these people's lives. And that you would take advantage of that opportunity given to you. I mean, who knows? Maybe they're just waiting for you to open up about your faith and share with them. Maybe they're just waiting for you to say, hey man, we're friends 
You want to come to church with me on Sunday? Wouldn't that be great? What's the worst thing they could say? Nah. And move on. But I want you to pray for something else. There's a second thing you need to pray for. It doesn't have anything to do with you, although it, it makes it, 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 uh, you have to make a determination about this. It has everything to do with them, and it comes down to this. It comes down to their being receptive. Are they receptive to hearing about your faith? And I think we need to pray that God, uh, pray for the people that God has placed in our life circle, that they would be receptive to hearing about our faith. So out of those names that you just wrote down in your bulletins and your sermon notes, which one of those people do you think would be the most receptive right now to hearing about it? Who would be most receptive? To hearing about your faith. Circle that person's name. I think Philip probably had it pretty easy, don't you? You know, if you think about it. What was the Ethiopian doing, doing when Philip showed up? Yeah, he's reading the Bible. How, how much more receptive can you get than that? He's reading from the prophet of Isaiah words about Jesus, and he's sitting there kind of scratching his head and saying, man, what does this mean? I have no idea. At least, at least he's searching, right? Um, it's pretty, pretty interesting. But you look in your life circle. What are the people doing in your life circle that shows that maybe they're receptive? Maybe they're reading the Bible. Maybe they're trying to get answers. Wouldn't that be awesome? But, but maybe, more than, maybe more than that, maybe they're going through some hard times. You have the answer. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're searching for purpose and meaning in their lives. You have the answer. Maybe, you know those people that don't have much joy in their lives, like they're always grumpy. You know, there's just no satisfaction there, and they're just, you have the answer. You have the answer. And I'm telling you, this isn't some pop quiz in a classroom, in a, in a classroom setting, you know, where you're covering up the answers so nobody can cheat off of you. Dude, open up your hand. Let them cheat off of you. You have the answer, and the answer is Jesus Christ. It's our job to plant the seed and for God to water it, to invite them to church, to share your faith with them. And we've got to figure out, are they receptive or not? What's the worst they can say? Nope, not interested. Okay, move on to the next one. Who is? Find somebody who's receptive to it. Jesus said this, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Isn't that sad? I wonder what the percentage is. How many workers do we have sitting in our congregation this morning? But the harvest out there is plentiful. And Jesus says, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Man, your elders and I, we're, we're praying that God rises up leaders in our congregation, workers, to go out to the harvest field and bring them in. We're praying for that because there are thousands of people in Barberton, Ohio, that are going to hell unless we get to them. I believe the harvest is ripe here in Barberton. And I'm praying that you and I would rise up to reap a harvest so that the church of Jesus Christ could grow. Plain and simple. I'm praying that we become the church in Barberton, Ohio that makes it hard for people to go to hell in Barberton, Ohio. I'm praying for that. Will you join me in that? Jesus told us, pray about this. Ask the Lord to send people into his harvest field. Do it. Pray about it. Because it's, it's ripe right now. But you... It's, and, and we can't just pray and wait for God to... It starts with you and me, right? We can't just pray and say, okay, Lord, rise up workers to go into your harvest field. Oh, hallelujah, praise God. No, send me is what we should pray. Give me opportunity to go out and share Jesus with everyone I know. All right? Relationship with God, relationship with people, are they receptive? Look at the people that determine, make a determination about the people that God has placed in your life. And finally, talk about it. Open your mouth. Share what you know. <laughs> Plain and simple. Share what you know. It kills me. There are Christians out there that they think they're going to win converts by going to debate creation versus evolution. 
What a load. You're not going to win any conference that way. You're just showing how whatever. That's dumb. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to know about creation and verse, uh, versus evolution. You don't, have to, you don't need to get into your pre-millennial or post-millennial or all-millennial views on the end times. Why? Who cares? You don't even have to have all the answers. You don't. Just share what you know. Just share what you know. What do you know? Verse 35 of of Acts chapter 8 says this, Philip began with that very passage of Scripture that the Ethiopian was reading, and he told him the good news about Jesus. Do you think they got into a debate on creation versus evolution? Do you think they talked about the end times? Do you think they, they sat around thinking this or that? No. Philip simply shared what he knew about Jesus. Now, fortunately, he'd spent three years with Jesus, so he knew a lot about Jesus. But I don't think he put it in in complicated terms. Philip shared what he knew about Jesus. What do you know about Jesus? What do you know about Jesus? Here's what's important. You know that he came to this world as a man, and he was perfect. You know that, right? I hope you know that. You know that Jesus died to take away our sins, right? I'm looking for head nods here. Yeah, you know that. You know that Jesus didn't stay dead, but that he rose from the grave, right? Simple. You know that uh, you love him. Good. You're in the right place. (laughs) In case you didn't know, this is a church building. We love Jesus here. You know that you love Jesus, and guess what? You know that Jesus loves you. And you know that Jesus poured out his love for you out of his grace and out of his mercy and that he grants you forgiveness of your sins and that he grants you a place in heaven someday. You know that. What else do you need to know? We sit in our Sunday school classes gaining more knowledge. We sit in our Bible studies gaining more knowledge. We sit at home reading our Bibles gaining more knowledge for what? It's time to stop gaining knowledge and actually share it with somebody. I can't get an amen on that one. (laughs) Thank you. Seriously, let's get out of the church building and into the world and share our faith with others who need to hear about it. Plain and simple. Sharing what you know with those who don't know comes back to your relationship with God. Plain and simple. If you don't have a relationship with God, you're not going to know who He is, and you're not going to be able to share it with anybody. Plain and simple. I want to wrap up with this, and I think the church really needs to hear this, because Philip shared his faith with a stranger on the road. This stranger on the road uh, came to faith in Jesus and was baptized right then and there. It was great. Here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? I think that's awesome. Here's what I think the church needs to hear. Listen closely. This stranger on the road, this Ethiopian wasn't saved because he decided one day his life wasn't right, so he went to church. People, non-Christians aren't going to come to our church just because they wake up one morning and say, oh, my life's terrible. This stranger on the road wasn't saved because he found a gospel tract sitting in a public restroom. This stranger wasn't saved one day because he stumbled across a TV preacher and laid his hand on the TV screen and got healed or whatever. He wasn't saved by any of those means. He was saved because Philip took seriously Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations. He was saved because Philip took time and was willing to go and sit with him. And we've got people in our lives that are waiting for us to just sit down and talk with them. Philip didn't wait for him to come and show up at church one Sunday morning. Philip didn't figure that someone else would talk with him. Or that it was up to the minister to get it done. Philip didn't figure that. Philip didn't figure that someone else uh, would go to him. He didn't drop a pamphlet or knock on his door, Philip went to him and sat with him and talked with him, and he took the time to build a relationship with him. Who's in your life circle? Who's in, who needs Jesus? Who's receptive right now to hearing about Jesus? You know, our church might have a lot going for it. 
And I think we do. You know, I think, I think we've got a lot of good things going on here. We do have uh, uh, good Bible studies together. I think we have a good youth program. Uh, we, I, we have a lot of people pitching in to make things happen here. I think we've got great, talented musicians. Uh, and we could have the most relevant sermons this town has ever heard. But you know what? The people in our city aren't ever going to know that unless you and I go to them and talk with them. I'm praying that we become a church filled with disciples of Jesus who make disciples of Jesus. Disciple is simple. Someone who's learning. That's a disciple. Are they learning and growing in their faith in Jesus Christ? And I want us to be a church like that, but also that are leading others to do the same thing. I'm praying that each and every one of us becomes a Philip to someone who needs Jesus. Will you be that person? Because I'm praying you are. I'm praying that every single person sitting in this room is someone like that, a Philip.